It sounds like a bad dream, like the one I was given in my 20s when I was struggling with the horror of nuclear weapons, having been raised reluctantly to accept that devilish logic of peace through mutually assured destruction. Nuclear weapons, because people still have to make a decision to go ahead and use them rather than do nothing and remain on a trajectory of disaster, they are amazingly the lesser of the key threats on which the foundations of global human culture are still resting. The way of life we have where fossil fuels justify shooting war and the war on the earth of tar sands and fracking, that's something which never ceases to edge the hands of the doomsday clock closer to midnight. We'll see where the learned society that moves those hands place them in 2021. Jesus, as we heard, predicts, if not the destruction of the planet, then unambiguously the end of the world, qualified by that lovely science fiction phrase, as we know it. And he's doing us a favour, telling it like it is. Lives end, eras end. Right now, the stories of countless fellow creatures who've accompanied our species through these few thousand years we proudly think of as our history are through exploitation or destruction of their habitats coming to an end. It sounds like a bad dream, as Jesus describes it in this earliest written gospel before theology got its act together. Like a bad dream, but that is the nature of the gift. The harvest of such dreams is that we do wake up more alert aware, convinced and ready to change. Real trees teach us, real skies enfold us, four real winds buffet us, and the glory that Christ comes in is besotted with justice. Even if we generally receive these things softened by the usual linguistic offenders. So the Son of Man is the child of and righteous heir of the creature shaped by God from the good earth reminded by God that they remain so. Climate change, which certainly messes with the sky, isn't then expected to impinge on heaven. And the brutal folktale of the master coming back doesn't then offend us with the scenario of terrified slaves rather than trusted, cherished servants. But this vindictive slave owner is absolutely not Jesus, nor the father neither, but the threats in person whom Christ faces with us. The opening dream, the words of Christ, they sound embarrassingly wild if you're trying to present Jesus as some sort of respectable, upright citizen. The most brilliant and therefore the most reviled of evangelism campaigns of recent memory was the one for Easter 1999, which portrayed Jesus as a Che Guevara revolutionary lookalike. It woke a few people up and that's all it was trying to do. You can argue about how appropriate it was otherwise, but still more mistaken is when we make Jesus into a remote and overpowered superhero who will solve all your emergencies for you, rather than welcoming a faithful, vulnerable companion, a friend, a partner, who may help you as you encounter these things, transforming rather than solving, reconciling or convincing rather than defeating. And if all else fails, taking to your heels as best you can, rather than dying in the rubble. This is the loving guidance of our Lord Jesus Christ. If all else fails, get the hell out while the going is good. Should I try to soften that? To make it more respectable and therefore more of a trap for the unwary? Advent is the Cinderella of Christian seasons, for it conceals such riches of encouragement for our day such assurance of the solidarity of God beyond and irrespective of certainty and precision. Such realism amidst scary stories which finally cannot but sound rather like those at the fringes of the news, those well-authenticated tales which editors keep in the shadows for fear of rocking the boat too much too soon. Advent is the season unambiguously focused on what is to come and being traditionally observed by means of stories dealing with global and existential threats, it could be the culmination of a Christian year, but by a fluke of perhaps scribal diary work, it's been slotted in at the beginning, where it immediately gets 
forgotten and overshadowed by shepherds and kings and, and baby worship. But seriously, what proportion of your congregation ever thinks of Advent as a time to be prepared for emergency, for endings, for turmoil? But I've realised in this job, Advent helps me celebrate. Advent helps me hope in the very face of the bad news, of things I cannot fix but can certainly respond to. Since October, the shops have orlept Advent to Christmas, that time which governments fear to permit to be other than normal, whatever that might be. So the plastic trees, the lights have already arrived at the ball. Cinderella's still at home scrubbing the floor, COVID or no COVID. And yet even the delightful, heartwarming story of the Nativity includes both the slaughter of the innocent children, not just boys, children, of Bethlehem, and the flight of the Holy Family as refugees to Egypt. It includes the ham-fisted intervention of the naive experts, aka the wise men, who trust empire with their knowledge, rather than put it at the disposal of the poor of the earth. Violence and tragedy are always as present to God in the flesh as they are to us, which is why this season could blossom as a gift which wakes us up in time, rather than the anaesthetic opium of the people, the sand in which the proverbial ostrich would hide their head. In Advent we discover that fleeing, adapting, mitigating, making the best of it, is the wise and courageous resort of the powerless when faced with threats beyond their capacity. This is the heroism of crisis. Live, not to fight, but to live another day. And the church is born out of that experience of the powerless. The counsel of Christ is not combat, but watchfulness and readiness to write off what cannot be carried forward. Even Holy Communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, builds on the Passover, that festival of urgency and, and of scarpering. There are still more barriers, of course, to the Gospel's wake-up call, like the crass and naive and arrogant cruelty of those scholars who conclude, in the absence of any other record of these events than the Bible itself, that the slaughter and the flight to Egypt must be proclaimed not to have happened. That takes the side of every oppressor who covers the tracks, every perpetrator of a hostile environment, for those without help or recognition, because if not then and there, with tragic abundance ever since and to this day, these things are true. The scripture sides with every one of God's creatures, perhaps sides with the earth herself, whose voice is silenced by being written out of history and out of the versions of faith which are approved by the powerful. And if Jesus can claim that aid or neglect to the most vulnerable is aid or neglect to himself, and that such things bring reward or penalty, then in the plight of those millions forced to flee by climate change and the destabilisation it brings to human cultures, then Jesus too is once more on the run. Jesus is in need of sanctuary. The very last thing that Jesus can be accused of is a saccharine promise that everything's going to be all right. Subsequent history would unmask that as untruth, and Mark 13 promises almost the complete opposite. Moreover, the radical unpredictability of it all is built in. Mark 13 frustrates Trinitarian purists with the statement that not even the sun can be pressured or deciphered to reveal or calculate the day or the hour of the combination of history before the age to come. So preparedness, mitigation, resilience, adaptation, all those sort of things are part and parcel of faithful living. How to face the way things do turn out. And because you're still in the game, by the grace of God, how we contribute to better outcomes than otherwise might have been. And today, right now, this moment, despite and because of its fleeting nature, right now is a pearl of opportunity beyond price. As creation cycles forward and God makes new from the ruins of what has been, God, in partnership with the earth, the sun, the moon, the seas, makes new. As God also looks to our own kind to find our place and purpose in all of it.